So, game. Tadi di strawo kay doktor. Dato ko si kay doktor tan yung ano niya. <laughs> Dam, madami, madami siya. Madami, madami. Ban, so uh, as a continuation of my discussion of the prostate, now I will be discussing the surgery of prostate cancer. So, namely, I will discuss uh, radical retropubic prostatectomy and laparoscopic prostatectomy, the procedures that uh, we have done in our institution. So, first, uh, radical retropubic prostatectomy. So, for the key points, uh, there is no better way to cure organ-confined prostate uh, cancer than total surgical removal. And the three goals of surgery in order of importance are first, of course, cancer control. Secondly, preservation of urinary control. And third, lastly, preservation of sexual function. Now for the indications, um, the indications for doing your radical retropubic prostatectomy, uh, which will also be the same for your laparoscopic prostatectomy, uh, as for prostate cancer in the T1 or T2 or a T3 that seems amenable to surgical removal with a wide resection. The contraindications, um, an uncorrectable bleeding, diathesis, and severe cardiopulmonary compromise. So for the preoperative considerations, of course, uh, the patient should undergo a complete preoperative assessment uh, to rule out the presence of any life-threatening conditions such as an MI, CVA, uh, cardiac arrhythmias, pulmonary emboli, hemorrhages, and anesthesia reactions. Also, uh, certain factors that may affect the technique of the procedure should be evaluated, such as a prior abdominal or pelvic surgery or irradiation, prior transuretral surgery, extensive prostate biopsy, significant inflammatory bowel disease, uh, prior use of mesh hernia repair, and of course, uh, prostate site. Uh, now, 15 to 20 percent of men develop an inguinal hernia after uh, radical retropubic prostatectomy. So, uh, preoperatively, we should be able to detect this uh, to enable preperitoneal hernia repairs concurrent to the radical prostatectomy. Uh, defer the prostatectomy for six to eight weeks after prostate needle biopsy. Defer it for 12 weeks if after TURP. This allows inflammatory adhesions or hematomas to resolve. Um, for the recommended prophylaxis, a first or second generation cephalosporin or aminoglycoside with metronidazole or clindamycin is advised. Uh, the preoperative management of anticoagulants and antiplatelet agents used for treatment of specific medical conditions should be uh, performed preoperatively in conjunction with the internist or cardiologist. Uh, as in terms of diet, patients should be put on clear diet on the day prior to surgery and an enema on the morning of the day itself. Uh, special instruments, uh, so prior to beginning your operation, be sure to prepare the following. Of course, a standard Balfour retractor with both narrow and wide malleable blades, coagulating forceps, small, fine, and regular sized right angled clamps, and medicine bomb scissors. For the anesthesia and preparation, uh, General, general endotracheal anesthesia is preferred and relative hypotension of less than 100 millimeters mercury is encouraged intraoperatively. The patient is positioned in the supine position and sterile insertion of a French 16 Foley catheter with a 20 ml balloon is done. Uh, in terms of positioning, a right-handed surgeon stands on the left side of the patient. So for the incision, um, an extraperitoneal lower abdominal incision is made uh, extending from the pubis toward the umbilicus. The anterior fascia is incised down to the pubis and the rectus muscles are separated at the midline and, uh, and the transversalis fascia is opened sharply to expose the space of radius. Uh, laterally, mobilize the peritoneum of the external iliac vessels to, to their bifurcation and then uh, place a self-retaining uh, Balfour retractor. Now, care should be taken to soft tissue covering the external iliac artery that contains the lymphatics that drain your lower extremities. Interruption of these lymphatics may lead to lower extremity edema or uh, lymphocele formation. So, after we have... Um, so, after that, after the incision, uh, we perform the lymphadenectomy. 
So the indication to performing your lymphadenectomy um, is one, uh, it is generally recommended, recommended in patients with intermediate or high-risk prostate cancer. And number two, those with a greater than 5% risk for nodal metastasis using a clinical nomogram. So for your lymphadenectomy, um, you facilitate the dissection by the placement of a narrow malleable blade to the balfour retractor beneath the mobilized vas deferens to displace the peritoneum superiorly and a deep deaver to displace the bladder median. You start on the ipsilateral side to the prostate nodule and then you divide the adventitia over the external iliac vein preserving the overlying lymphatics. You, con you then continue the dissection beneath the external iliac vein out to the pelvic side wall and then inferiorly to your uh, femoral canal. So the dissection then proceeds cranially along the pelvic side wall to the bifurcation of the uh, common iliac artery where the lymph nodes in the angle between the external iliac and the hypoplastic arteries are located. So you remove the obturator nodes with attentive care to the obturator, obturator nerve. And then you continue the, your dissection down to the pelvic floor. And after this, uh, you perform it on the opposite side. Now, uh, after you have done your lymphadenectomy, uh, now uh, we begin the exposure of the prostate. So you displace the peritoneum superiorly with a malleable bladder to expose the anterior surface of the prostate. You dissect the fibro adipose tissue covering the prostate to expose the following structures, your pelvic fascia, your, your pubo-prostatic ligaments, and the superficial branch of the dorsal vein. The end of pelvic fascia is entered where it reflects over the pelvic side wall away from its attachments to the bladder and the prostate. So over here is an illustration that shows where the incision is to be made in the endopelvic fascia. So after that incision, uh, it is extended in an anteromedial, di anteromedial direction toward the pubo-prostatic ligaments, allowing palpation of the lateral prostate. Uh, now, it's important to remember that there are small arterial and venous branches from the potential vessels that are encountered here and should be ligated. Um, so, after this, you dissect the superficial branch of the dorsal vein from the medial edge of the ligaments and then coagulate and divide. You use the scissors to divide uh, each pubo-prostatic ligament. The dissection should be continued down far enough to expose the juncture between the apex of the prostate and the anterior surface of the dorsal vein complex. The pubo-urethral component of the complex should be spared uh, to preserve the anterior fixation of the striated urethral sphincter to the pubis. So now we proceed to a very important part of the surgery, which is the ligation and division of the dorsal vein complex. So the goal is to provide the complex with minimal blood loss while avoiding damage to the striated sphincter and inadvertent entry to the anterior apex of the prostate. So the goals in this, in this step is to control much of the venous bleeding, to recapitulate uh, the puboprostatic ligaments to provide additional anterior support to the stated sphincter, and the fixation of the dorsal vein anteriorly. So first, you push the prostate posteriorly with a sponge stick, and then you pass a monocryl 3 suture through the dorsal vein complex just distal to the prostatic apex. In placing this stitch, the surgeon should face the head of the table, holding the needle driver against the pubis perpendicular to the patient. So after this, the needle is then reversed and placed through the pubic symphysis. So you are not to cut the suture. A chromic 2 figure of 8 suture is then placed on the anterior surface of the prostate to reduce bleeding from the proximal dorsal vein complex. Uh, now, um, you apply downward pressure on the anterior surface of the prostate with a sponge stick and divide the complex using, meds using medicine bomb scissors. This is usually started on the left side where the junction with the prostatic apex can be seen. And the prostatic apex is the most common site for positive surgical margins because it is difficult to identify the anterior apical surface of the prostate. If the straighted sphincter is divided too close to the prostatic apex, there is risk that the neurovascular bundle may be damaged. Um, as the neuro neurovascular bundle approaches the apex, it is often fixed medially between the straighted sphincter by an apical vessel. So the monocryl 3O suture that was placed previously is then used to oversue the superficial edges of the straighted urethral sphincter dorsal vein complex. 
again, during this step, the surgeon should be facing the head of the table, holding the needle driver against the pubis. Uh, to control the back bleed from the anterior surface of the prostate, the edges of the proximal dorsal vein complex on the anterior surface, uh, on the anterior surface are then soon, uh, sewn together. So by pulling the edges together, the tension on the prostatic fascia is evenly distributed. So after ligation of the dorsal vein complex, we proceed to the division of the urethra. So you, again, you displace the, the prostate superiorly with a sponge stick. And then the lateral bands of striated muscle should be released at their midpoint. You pass a right angle clamp around the smooth muscle of the urethra and with scissors divide the anterior two thirds of the urethra with care to avoid damage to the Foley catheter. So here, uh, that, there's the right angle clamp in cutting of the anterior two thirds of the urethra. Um, now, for the placement of your urethral sutures, uh, with a monocrine 3O on a 5A cir circle tapered needle, the needle should incorporate just the urethral mucosa and submucosa, but not the smooth muscle. The first suture is placed in the mucosa and submucosa of the urethra at the 12 o'clock position. And then once the mucosa and the submucosa are elevated by the sutures, more sutures are placed in the 2, 10, 5, and 7 o'clock positions. The Foley catheter is then removed and the 6 o'clock uh, suture is placed. So here uh, is a diagram showing the placement of the sutures. So initially at the 12 o'clock and then 2, 10, 5, and 7. And after placing those sutures, you remove the catheter allowing you to place a suture at the 6 o'clock position. So after your sutures are in place, uh, you then proceed to the division of the posterior urethra. So you begin with passing a right angle clamp immediately beneath the posterior portion of the urethra. The clamp should pass midway between the prostatic apex and the urethra, and the left border is then divided with scissors and then repeated on the other side. After cutting from both sides, then you can proceed with cutting the central component. So here uh, is the division of the posterior urethra. You start on one side, you move to the other, and then you cut the central complex. So now, uh, for nerve sparing, um, the neurovascular bundle is outside the prostate between layers of the lateral pelvic fascia or the levator fascia and the prostatic fascia. So to avoid bleeding, uh, bleeding from the capsular arteries and veins, surgeons dissect beneath the prostatic fascia or an interfascial dissection. Because this plane is directly on the prostatic parenchyma, the risk for positive surgical margins is high. However, the most common site, again, as I mentioned before, the most common site for positive margins in prostatectomy is the apex, followed by um, the posterior, and lastly, the posterolateral site. So actually, there is same rate of positive margins for nerve sparing and non-nerve sparing prostatectomies. So how is the decision made as to when and where to excise the neurovascular bundle? So preoperatively, there is no definite decision. Of course, uh, we should assess the sexual function of the patient if there is a palpable lesion and if there's a high probability of capsular penetration. So no final surgery, I know final decision is done until surgery. And when you proceed with opening the endopelvic fascia, if there's an induration palpable in the lateral pelvic fascia, the neurovascular bundle on that side is widely excised. If there is no induration but the neurovascular bundle appears to be fixed to the prostate during release, it is also excised. If there appears to be inadequate tissue over the posterior lateral surface of the prostate that has been removed, the neurovascular bundle can then be widely excised. So, so this begins after incision of the urethra, placement of the urethral sutures and release of the posterior st uh, striated sphincter. So you begin with a right angle clamp, you re release the superficial layers of the levator fascia. A Babcock clamp or a sponge stick is then used during the release of the neurovascular bundle to manipulate the prostate. So, so, so you begin the dissection at the bladder neck where, a fascia fo where the fascia forms a thick band. Then you release the super fascia, superficial fascia from the bladder neck to the apex. The location of the neurovascular bundle is identified by the presence of a subtle groove on the posterior lateral edge of the prostate. And then you trace this groove to the apex. Once the medial border of the neurovascular bundle has been identified at the apex, the dissection and the midline can then be carried posteriorly to the rectum. 
So once the plane between the rectum and the prostate has been developed, you can now release the neurovascular bundle from the prostate beginning at the apex, moving toward the base. Uh, beginning on the rectal surface, the bundle is released from the prostate by spreading a right angle clamp gently. So you continue the dissection to the midpoint of the prostate. Nawala, nawala. Nawala, sir. So, the vascular branches of your neurovascular bundles are best controlled by small hemoclips uh, parallel to the bundle. The ther thermal energy of any form should never be used um, on the neurovascular bundle. If fixation of the bundle to the prostate cannot be explained by vascular branches, the NVB should then be excised. At the level of the seminal vesicles, look for prominent arterial uh, for a prominent arterial arterial branch traveling from the neurovascular bundle over the seminal vesicles to supply the base of the prostate. You then ligate this vessel on each side and divide it. So after dividing the those branches, the neurovascular bundle is essentially free. Now, um, if you instead choose to excise the neurovascular bundle um, before excise before Excision, the contralateral neurovascular bundle should be freed from the prostate. The NVB to be excised should be identified at the apex and the right angle clamp is passed from medial to lateral immediately on the anterior surface of the rectum. The dissection is continued by dividing the fascia on the lateral surface of the rectum from the apex to the base so that the neurovascular bundle and the abundant fascial tissue are included in the specimen. You terminate the dissection at the tip of the seminal vesicle where the bundle is ligated and divided. So after that, you proceed with the posterior dissection and division of your lateral pedicles. So you replace the catheter and apply light traction. The attachment between the rectum and the denonvillers fascia is divided in the midline posteriorly. At this point, the lateral pedicle can be divided safely on the lateral surface of the seminal vesicles without injury to the neurovascular bundle. The lateral pedicles are thick and therefore need to be divided in a sequential way. So you start with a superficial one, which is labeled here as number one. And then you move on to the middle and then the deep. If you divide them all at once, there is risk for cutting into the overlying cost. I don't know, sorry. For posterior days, uh, so, and then you, uh, once you have di uh, divided your lateral pedicles, you control arterial bleeders with hemoclips. The day section then proceeds superiorly onto the anterior lateral surface of the junction between the bladder and the prostate. The denonvillers fascia is divided over the tips of the seminal vesicles to facilitate removal. The bladder neck is then incised anteriorly at the prostata vesicle junction. The incision is carried down to the mucosa, then the mucosa is incised. The Foley balloon is then deflated and the two ends of the catheter are clamped together for more adequate traction. As the incision in the bladder neck is widened, branches running from the inferior vesicle pedicle to the prostate are noted at the 5 and 7 o'clock positions. So after the pedicles are divided, it should be possible to visualize the plane between the anterior surface of the seminal vesicles and the posterior wall of the bladder. By scissor, by scissor dissection, hugging the anterior surface of the seminal vesicles, the posterior bladder neck can then be divided safely while observing the location of the ureteric orifices. After the posterior wall is divided, the bladder neck is retracted with an alice clamp and the vas deferens are ligated and divided. The seminal vesicles are dissected free from the surrounding structures and any residual at that attachments of the denonvillers fascia are divided and the specimen is removed. So after you have removed the specimen, you should inspect carefully the operative site for bleeding. To avoid injury to the fine nerve uh, fibers, small bleeding vessels near the neurovascular bundle should not be cauterized. Bleeding from those vessels should be controlled with small hemoclips as the patient may develop a hematoma between the rectum and the bladder. So now after you have removed your specimen, you proceed to bladder neck reconstruction and anastomosis. The bladder neck is reconstructed with a running suture or interrupted 2O absorbable sutures to approximate 
the full thickness muscularis and mucosa, forming a tennis racket closure. The closure is initiated in the midline posteriorly and proceeds anteriorly until the bladder neck is narrowed to approximate the diameter of the urethra. At this point, it is useful to have previously injected indigo carmine to facilitate visualization of the ureteric orifice. Also, by incorporating the mucosa in the closure, uh, troublesome hematoria can be avoided. Interrupted or running 4-0 absorbable sutures are then used to advance the mucosa over the raw musculature of the bladder neck. In this way, a rosette of mucosa covers the bladder neck, facilitating a mucosa to mucosa urethrovesical anastomosis. Uh, buttressing sutures can also be used to intercept the bladder neck. These sutures prevent the bladder neck from pulling open when the bladder fills. A chromic 2O suture is placed into the edges of the posterior bladder wall where the bladder was previously attached to the prostate. 2CM from the reconstructed bladder neck and tied in the midline. A second suture is placed anteriorly. A second chromic 2O figure of 8 suture lateral to the bladder neck is then placed on each side. The bladder neck should protrude beneath the anterior hood of the tissue that was created by the anterior switch, resembling a turtle poking its head outside its shell or a turtle neck configuration. A new Foley catheter is placed through the urethra into the pelvis. Six monocryl 3 sutures are now placed through the bladder neck in their corresponding position from the inside to outside. The bladder neck is exposed by placing traction on the absorbable suture at the 6-0 position. The final anastomosis is performed by placing the sutures in the 12, 2, 5, 7, 10 o'clock, and 6 o'clock positions in the bladder neck. Uh, afterwards, you manipulate the catheter to make certain it is not caught in any of the sutures. So after that closure, um, the catheter is irrigated to eliminate clots. After the operative site is irrigated with sal saline, a small suction drain is placed through the fascia and directed into the operative site between the rectus muscle. The incision is closed to the running nylon 2O suture. For post-operative management, men can ambulate on the evening of the procedure and dis discharged on the second post-operative day. Clear liquids may be offered on the evening of the surgery and regular diet on the next day. The drain may be left in place until discharge or when it produces less than 15, 50 ml per day. The catheter, the catheter is left in place for 7 to 10 days. Uh, in terms of intraoperative complications, hemorrhage is the most common intraoperative problem, which is, uh, and also they are usually venous. They can be controlled by packing, exposure, suturing, and clip ligation. If there is troublesome bleeding from the dorsal, ve dorsal vein complex at any point, the surgeon should completely divide the dorsal vein complex over the urethra and over so the end. Average blood loss for prostatectomy, open prostatectomy, is 300 to 1 liter, 300 ml to 1 liter. Other less common intraoperative complications, um, obturator, obturator nerve injury during pelvic lymph node dissection. Uh, if completely transected, you should attempt reanastomosis, as well as rectal injuries, uh, which is often encountered during apical dissection in attempting to develop the pain between the rectum and the denonbiliaries. Attempt to interpose, in, interpose the momentum between the rectal closure and the vesicourethral anastomosis to reduce the possibility of a rectourethral fistula. In salvage prostatectomy, diverting colostomy is performed. Ureteral injuries are very rare and they usually occur secondary to inadvertent dissection within the trigode. Uh, in these cases, ureteral reimplantation should be performed. Life-threatening delayed hemorrhage is a rare complication. Patients requiring acute transfusions for severe hypotension after RP should be explored early to evacuate the pelvic hematoma in an effort to decrease the risk for bladder neck contracture and incontinence. It's likely good of this complication is between 14 to 28 days postoperatively. For preventive measures, um, careful, positioning, careful positioning in the operating, operating room to avoid compression of the lower extremity veins, use of intermittent, intermittent compression devices, and early ambulation. Patients should be informed of the signs and symptoms of DVT, such as swelling or pain in the leg, especially in the calf, 
sudden chest pain worsened by deep breathing, hemoptysis, shortness of breath, sudden Okay. Okay. So for bladder neck contracture, uh, this is considered in patients complaining of poor urinary stream or prolonged unexplained incontinence. Treatment for cases like this is with cystoscopic dilation and then cold knife incision and afterwards intermittent self catheterization. The incontinence is usually secondary to intrinsic sphincter deficiency. The predominant cause is injury during ligation and division of the dorsal vein complex. It can also be caused by a bladder neck diameter that is excessively large. So, intraoperatively, it is important to preserve the straightened sphincter during apical dissection to avoid tension on the final anastomosis, and the bladder neck reconstruction should be small and supple. Erectile dysfunction. Um, Three factors are important in the recovery of erectile function after radical prostatectomy. So first, it's patient age. Uh, patient must be less than 65 years old. Of course, the preoperative potency status and the uh, intraoperative preservation of the neurovascular abundance. Recovery of sexual function occurs gradually. Uh, three months, 38% have recovered. At six months, 54%. After a year, 73%. And at 18 months, 86% of cases have recovered uh, their sexual function. High anterior release of the neurovascular bundle is associated with significant early recovery. And PDE5 inhibitors augment sexual recovery after RP. Okay, so after discussing the open procedure, we will now proceed to the laparoscopic equivalent, which is the laparoscopic radical prostatectomy with pelvic lymphadenectomy. So similar to um, the open procedure, the indications are T1 or T2 or T3, T, uh, T3 that seems to be uh, amenable to surgical removal with a wide dissection. Contra contraindications are also similar. For preoperative considerations, uh, because this is a minimally invasive procedure, morbidly obese patients pose additional challenges, even to experienced surgeons. Uh, they are more prone to positioning injuries such as nerve compression injuries, they have a potential risk for respiratory compromise and for DVTs. Also, um, orbitally obese patients will present a relatively limited working space and limitation of trocar size. In those cases, extra long trocars and placing them 1 to 2 cm more cephalad is done to improve the angle of approach. Also, patients with large prostate volumes, more than 80 grams, offer technical challenges. A concomitant median lobe will make division of the posterior bladder neck more challenging. Also, a wider dorsal vein complex and a more vascular pedicle. Patients who have also undergone a prior TRP will have a more complex bladder neck anatomy. It is strongly advised the more complex patient scenarios be avoided in a surgeon's early experience with laparoscopic radical prostatectomy. However, these patient features are not themselves Absolute contraindications for a minimally invasive approach to the surgery. Now, for instrumentation, um, I'll, uh, I won't read them anymore. Just you can just uh, take a look at them. So, yeah, <laughs> medyo ma madami. Ang important jan is, of course, your lapset, but also your small and medium, small, medium, large hemolac clips, a vicral O suture. Um, and a monocryl 3 o double arm suture. So for the preoperative uh, preparation, uh, preoperative mechanical bowel preparation or a fleet enema, enema can be given to reduce colonic distension. A broad spectrum antibiotic such as cefazolin is given 30 minutes prior to skin incision. Um, laparoscopic radical prostatectomy requires that the surgical team including the circ circ circulating nurse, surgical assistants, be fully trained and skilled in the instrumentation, operative setup, and technical steps of the procedure. So this is the positioning for a, lapar a laparoscopic radical prostatectomy. The robot is optional. So after induction of general anesthesia, the patient is placed in the steep Tendelenburg position with arms and hands carefully tucked and padded at the sides. 
Compression stocking devices are placed on both legs and the patient's legs are spread apart and supported by spreader bars to allow for access to the rectum and perineum. Alternatively, the patient's legs may be placed in stirrups in the low lithotomy position. The patient is then secured firmly to the table using heavy cloth tape. And fixed rest should be avoided as this can fixed shoulder rests should be avoided as this can result in compression injury to the shoulders and the brachial plexus. A neurogastic tube and uh, sterile catheter is placed. Um, anesthesia considerations, your anesthesiologist should be aware of the potential consequences for carbon dioxide insufflation and pneumoperitoneum, such as an initial vagal response, oliguria, and hypercarbia. Prompt adjustment in the minute and tidal volumes must be required in the event of rising end tidal carbon dioxide levels, live levels and hypercarbia, which may lead to systemic acidosis if left uncorrected. So we begin with a transperitoneal approach. This is the most common approach to laparoscopic radical prostatectomy. So in this approach, the space of retsius is immediately entered and the prostate gland, seminal vesicle, and vasa are dissected from an anterior approach. This is favored by most surgeons because of the greater working space and familiar landmarks. So you begin um, by establishing pneumoperitoneum using a various needle inserted at the base of the umbilicus or an open hasen technique. The hasen technique consists of creating a small umbilical incision under direct visualization to enter the abdominal cavity, followed by the introduction of a blunt trocar. The left upper quadrant is a safe location for patients with prior midline scars. And then you begin your initial insufflation. You use, uh, you use a visual obturator to enter the peritoneal cavity, and the laparoscope is used through a single trocar to release the adhesion, adhesions and create enough space for additional trocar placement. After all trocars are placed, CO2 insufflation is maintained between 12 to 15 minutes. So this is your trocar positioning. Um, the surgeon stands at the patient's left side and operates through the two pararectus trocars. Assistants use the lateral most trocars. The trocar in the middle is for the camera. So now for the extraperitoneal approach, a uh, 1.5 centimeter incision is made at the level just beneath the umbilicus. And this section is carried down through the anterior rectus sheath. Using a blunt, fing using blunt uh, finger dissection, a space is created immediately anterior to the posterior rectus sheath and underlying peritoneum. A trocar tro mounted balloon dilator device is inserted to the preperitoneal space anterior to the rectus sheath and advanced and buds down to the pubis along the midline. So here is your balloon. Um, using a zero degree 10 millimeter endoscope inserted through the balloon trocar, approximately 500 ml of air is inflated to develop the space of its use under laparoscopic view. The operation then proceeds in the exact manner as the transperitoneal approach. So, transperitoneal versus extraperitoneal. The mean operative time uh, in some studies was shorter with the extraperitoneal approach 170 minutes to 230 minutes for the extraperitoneal approach. Time to full diet is also less with the extraperitoneal approach in some studies. However, uh, most studies have found little or no difference in operative time and perioperative outcomes between the two approaches. With the, external, with the extraperitoneal approach, however, the peritoneum acts as a natural barrier, minimizing potential for bowel injury and preventing the bowels from falling into the operative field. There is, however, a reduced working space. Overall, the choice between extra and transperitoneal approach to laparoscopic radical prostatectomy is largely a, mat lar largely a matter of surgeon preference. So after access, we now develop the space of retius. So once inside, you inspect your, the contents of the pelvis and you lyse adhesions if present. Uh, frequently, adhesions are noted between the sigmoid colon and the left lateral pelvic sidewall. These, adhesion, these adhesion, adhesions should be sharply released to allow the sigmoid colon to be retracted out of the pelvic cavity. The bladder is then dissected from the anterior abdominal wall by dividing the rachis, uracus high above the bladder and incising the peritoneum bilaterally, immediately lateral to the medial umbil umbilical ligaments using monopolar scissors. The presence of pre-vesical fat, fatty alveolar, uh, presence of pre-vesical fatty alveo alveolar tissue confirms the proper plane of dissection. 
um, so applying posterior encephala traction on the uracus, the retro pubic space is rapidly developed with a combination of blunt and sharp dissection along the relatively avascular plane. Lateral dissection of the bladder is carried out down toward the crossing of the median umbilical ligaments and vast deference to ensure optical mobility of the bladder, which minimizes tension when performing anastomosis. Anastomosis later on in the procedure. All tissue overlying the prostate is then removed using sharp dissection and electrocautery as needed. You coagulate superficial branches of the dorsal vein complex with uh, electrocautery. At this point, the visual, visible landmark should be the anterior bladder wall, the prostate, the pubo-prostatic ligaments, the endopelvic fascia, and the pubis. The endopelvic fascia and pubo-prostatic ligaments are then sharply divided, exposing the levator muscle fibers, fibers attached to the lateral and apical portions of the prostate. You bluntly dissect the fibers, fibers from the surface of the prostate, which will expose the deep dorsal vein complex and urethra at their confluence with the prostatic apex. Uh, now we proceed to ligation of the deep dorsal venous complex. You retract the prostate and bladder cephalad um, used to achieve optimal exposure of your venous complex. The deep, um, uh, the deep venous complex is suture ligated using a vicryl O as close to the pubis and as far from the prostatic apex as possible. The needle is passed beneath the deep dorsal, vein, dorsal venous complex and anterior to the urethra. A second, more distal venous complex stitch can be placed and used to suspend it to the inferior pubic symphysis. A common observation, though, is that profuse bleeding sometimes encountered in open surgery is less apparent because of the tamponade effect on, bead, on venous bleeding offered by the pneumoperitoneum, even when the um, dorsal vein complex is entered. So after we have controlled the deep dorsal vein complex, we proceed to bladder neck identification and transection. The visual identification of the point of transition of the perivesical fat to the anterior pros prostate is now devoid of fat and can now serve as a guide. Intermittent and repetitive caudal retraction of the catheter balloon can help approximate the transition. However, any deviation of the balloon from the midline signifies the presence of a median lobe of the prostate. Or it can also be misleading in, case of post, in cases of post-TRP cases. You can also use four steps to grasp and retract the bladder dome, cephalad, which will result in tenting of the bladder neck at its prostatic attachment. The anterior bladder is divided horizontally using monopolar scissors along the midline until the urethral catheter is identified. The balloon is then depleted at the tip of the catheter and the tip of the catheter is brought through the bladder neck opening and lifted anteriorly with an assistant applying counter traction externally at the penal meatus to suspend the prostate. And now you inspect the bladder neck for the presence of a median lobe and locate the ureteric orifices. If a vertical drop off of the posterior bladder neck mucosa is noted, this suggests the absence of a median lobe. If there is a median lobe, it may be delivered out of the bladder by anterior retraction with forceps. The posterior bladder neck is horizontally divided with monopolar scissors, staying along the midline. The section is carried in a 45 degree downward angle. Now we proceed to the dissection of the seminal vesicles in the past deference. So in the anterior approach, uh, the dissection of the seminal vesicles and the vas deferens is deep within the cul de sac. We dissect the vas from lateral to medial toward their confluence in the ejaculatory ducts. The seminal vesicles are posterior lateral to the distal vas. For the retrovesical approach, uh, which is useful in cases of median lobe, in which identification and dissection of these structures by the anterior approach is more challenging because of the median lobe, in this approach, the vasa and the seminal vesicles are identified deep within the retrovesical space. The neurovascular bundles are dissected off the seminal vesicles in an anti-grade direction from the tip to the base. So now we proceed to developing the plane between the prostate and the rectum. Anterior retraction of the vas deference and seminal vesicles, excuse me, by an assistant helps identification of the proper plane. You make a two to three centimeter horizontal incision through the posterior layer of the denonvillers fascia, approximately 0.5 cm below the base of the seminal vesicles. 
and then you proceed with using blunt dissection to develop the plane between the posterior prostate and the rectum. This plane of dissection is relatively avascular and should be carried all the way to the prostatic apex and laterally to the medial aspect of the prostatic pedicle. When a wider margin of tissue is desired along the posterior aspect of the prostate, the denonvillous fascia should be sharply incised. Substantial bleeding suggests dissection may be too close to the prostate. Uh, at this juncture, uh, it can be useful to switch to a 30-degree lens to allow for better visualization. Now, um, for the control of your prostatic pedicles, uh, hemolock clips are commonly employed for ligation of your prostatic pedicles as electrocautery may damage the nearby neurovascular bundles. However, the clips require good proximal and distal delineation and thinning of the pedicle tissue. You should remove any clips that fall off to avoid placing the clips in close proximity to the vesicourethral anastomosis as migration of the clips into the bladder can lead to post-operative voiding symptoms, hematuria, recurrent UTIs, and systolithiasis. So pictured here are uh, clips left in the bladder after surgery. Now, um, we proceed to the preservation of the neurovascular bundle. So first, you incise the levator fascia sharply along the anterior medial aspect of the mid portion of the prostate, entering into the interfascial plane of dissection. The blunt dissection is carried out along the shiny white prostatic fascial plane, gently sweeping the neurovascular bundle off the prostate in a posterior lateral direction, partially releasing it and developing a visible groove. The groove will then serve as a landmark for hemoclip placement and division of the prostatic pedicle. Thermal energy should be minimized or completely avoided as the nerves are highly susceptible to thermal injury. Also, the groove will serve as a landmark for hemoclip placement and division of the prostatic pedicle while avoiding entrapment of the neurovascular band. Afterwards, we proceed with the apical dis dissection. So you divide your dorsal vein complex, of course, after confirming that the stitch is in place. After division, the prostatic apex and its junction with the urethra should be visible. As much urethral length as possible should be maintained, but a protruding anterior posterior lip of the prostate must be recognized. Uh, actually, it is advisable to leave a small rim of the urethra along with the prostatic apex. Sharp dissection with limited use of cautery is employed for apical dissection. Um, upon completely freeing the prostate gland and before entrapment of the specimen, the entire surface of the gland must be inspected to assess the adequacy of resection and the integrity of tissues covering the specimen. If concern exists regarding a closed surgical margin, additional tissue may be excised specific to the location of concern. So now we proceed with ectomy. Um, incision is made just lateral to the medial umbilical ligament back towards its confluence with the hypogastric artery down to the pubis. So in this illustration, the dashed line indicates the longitudinal incision. Um, and then we proceed with separation of lymph node, the lymph node packet from an external iliac vein. The packet is grasped and retracted medially. And by retracting it medially, the precise course of the obturator nerve and vessels can be identified and protected. The section is then carried out proximally to the iliac bifurcation and distally to the pubis. pubis. After securing the distal extent of the lymph nodes with hemoclips, the packet is divided, retracted cranially, and bluntly separated from the obturator vessels and nerved by blunt dissection. Hemoclips are also placed on the proximal extent of the nodal packet. The lymph nodes uh, can be removed as a single packet and extracted along with the prostate specimen. So after you have removed your prostate and your lymph nodes, we proceed to entrapment of specimens. The prostate and pelvic lymph nodes are entrapped within a 10 mm laparoscopic entrapment sac and introduced into the abdomen to a 12 mm trocar and stored there until completion. And now we proceed to bladder neck reconstruction. In the event of a large prostate gland, a median lobe or prior TORP, the bladder neck often may be disproportionately larger than the urethra. A tennis racket handle closure can be performed using observable sutures either posteriorly or anteriorly. And of course, you should identify the ureteral orifices. To provide posterior support to your vesicoureteral anastomosis, you approximate the remnant denonvillous fascia and posterior bladder neck to the posterior rhabdosphincter beneath the urethra 
using a uh, continuous running monocryl 2 suture before completion of your anastomosis. And now, into the anastomosis itself, um, two separate sutures are tied together at their ends, each 6 to 8 inches in length. Uh, also, you can use a double arm suture. You begin the anastomosis posteriorly, leaving two needles to run progressively in an anterior direction on either side. So here is a depiction of that. So two sutures on either side. Uh, multiple sutures are first placed through the urethra and bladder before progressive cinching of the anastomosis by lifting of each arm of the suture in an anterior direction. The final catheter is placed under direct vision immediately before completion of the anastomosis. So after completion of your anastomosis, you proceed to the delivery of the specimen and exiting the abdomen. Before removal of the specimen, you should examine the operative field for bleeding under low insufflation. Uh, you should also examine the nearby bowels. The closure of the fascial defects uh, for 5 and 8 millimeter trocars are not necessary. Closure for the 12 millimeter trocar sites, however, should be done. The string for the specimen sac is then transferred to the camera port at the umbilicus and the abdomen is completely dissipated. Uh, the specimens within the sac are extracted through, incision, through extension of the umbilical trocar site. The fascial defect is then closed by open suture placement and skin defects are closed with subcuticular sutures. So for the post-operative management, uh, parenteral narcotic medication is required for the first day post-surgery. Majority of patients can resume more fluids and diet within 8 to 12 hours of surgery. A pelvic drain is not always necessary. However, if it is placed, it may be introduced via uh, an 8 millimeter trocar site and can be removed on the first or second post-operative day. Within a week or more of an indwelling catheter, the vast majority of patients are able to avoid adequately with minimal risk for post-operative retention. However, in cases of extensive bladder neck reconstruction for those with large prostates, median lobes, or post-ERP cases, it is prudent to leave the catheter for 10 days and obtain a cystogram to confirm a watertight anastomosis. In cases of extravasation, longer catheterization is required. Um, most patients are... Most patients are able to return to all normal physical activity by four to six weeks and strenuous physical activity at six weeks. Now, for the post-operative complications, intraperitoneal urine leak, uh, patients can develop paralytic ileus secondary to the anastomotic leak. A percutaneous drain may be placed and prolonged urethral catheterization is advised. You can also perform cystogram to confirm resolution of the leak. Bladder neck strictures occur at 16% which can be managed by bladder neck incision followed by prolonged catheterization. Pelving lymph node dissection complications include post-operative lymphocytes, DVTs, lower extremity edema, obturator nerve, obturator nerve injury, and ureteral nerve injury. And Whew. Uh, thank you, Ralph. Uh, do we have any questions? So far, there's no questions in the chat box. Uh, do we have any comments for Dr. Rabanan? Tapagod! Ganda nga yun, sobrang detail. Ang hirap gawin, kaya hindi ko na na-spell check. Ang haba ng chapter. Okay lang, at least natin authentic yung... Oo, oh, alam nyo, ginawa ako. <laughs> hindi copy-paste to. Okay, so I don't think we have any questions. Uh, for next week, we don't have anything on Monday. But uh, on Wednesday, we'll have our uh, interior. We'll have it on Wednesday. We'll have it on Wednesday. Wrong. Dr. Makalalag may tanong. Wrong. Yes, sir. Rome, I have regarding the lecture. I have comments. Okay, number one, yung I I, I came in a little late, pero sabi kasi do sa open prostatectomy general anesthesia. Yes, sir. I don't know if I missed that, pero kasi pwede rin gawin yun under spinal with epidural eh. Ah, yes, sir. Ang open. Yes, sir. Actually, sir, in camp, it was only mentioned in passing. Uh, it was only mentioned that preferred, pero wala namang specific na 
indication to do it under general anesthesia. Okay, next. Uh, have you heard of Veil of Aphrodite? Oh, I was not able to encounter it, sir, while reading for this topic. Okay. Sige. Ang Veil of Aphrodite is more or less the technique when you try to preserve the, the neurovascular bundle as you cut through the lateral prostatic fascia. You have to understand or you, you try to learn on, also on Veil of Aphrodite because common niya na ginagamit na term pag nagpa-prostatectomy, lalo na sa robotic. Mm. So that's my second comment. Third comment. Have you heard of Rocco Stitch? The Rocco Stitch, yes, sir. I was able to encounter it. The Rocco Stitch is yun yung posterior support ng vesicourethral anastomosis, sir, di ba? Correct, yun. Kaya ako lang naman ini-emphasize sa inyo kasi pag nag-uusap na yan sa conventions, they don't discuss the technique. Eh. They just say the term. Uh, the veil of Aphrodite, the rock of so on. Number four naman, regarding yung sinabing the pelvic drain is not necessary. I agree, it is not necessary for a radical prostatectomy, but by experience, he would rather leave it because what if you have a leak? Number one. Number two, what if you have a lymphocil? Yes, sir. Number three, what if you have... At least, nandun na siya. You can remove if you... I mean, tama, it's not necessary, but that's why you put it there. Yes, sir. I guess it's a... Ano lang yan eh. Safe, ano to? Security blanket mo lang. Actually, so, no, it is not necessary. Yes, sir. You're parang ano. I was, lang, tama sir. naman. Yun lang yung comment. Yes, sir. As I was reading it, sir, actually, the perspective, of course, is from the authors. From, of course, in the West, where they are very familiar with the laparoscopy and of, probably the procedure is not as technical for them as it is over here. So that's why maybe bas, ano sila, may, may, mas mayabang sila na hindi sila nagdidrain. Actually, yung ambulation nila a day after. And ano, kami usually, we wait for the normalization of bowel function prior to resuming the diet. But all those I discussed, they were what was discussed in Campbell. Hindi yun yung actual practice namin dito, sir. Of course, in our cases, we, ano, we put in the drain. Mm, yes. So, yun. Yun lang yung mga... Pwede, meron na nagpo-posterior. Ang gagawin sa posterior, makikita mo yung vas deference, eh. Sa likod, di ba? Yes, sir. Sundan mo na yung vas deference. Kasi, pag dikit dun sa gitna, makita mo na yung dalawang vas deference, Lateral to it, nandun na yung uh, seminal vesicle. Yes, sir. Actually, sir, mo na. incorporated siya dun sa report ko, only nandun siya sa part ng dissection ng ano, bus and seminal. Merong retrovesical approach tsaka anterior approach. So, yun yata yun, sir, yung retrovesical approach. Actually, Correct, we've been lucky enough naka-assist na ako kay Dr. Tan. We've done oh. five na oh. posterior approach. Ganda outcomes, sir, no? Ganda outcomes. Mas mabilis kasi ma-free yung seminal vesicle. Pag purely anterior, ang hirap dukutin yung seminal vesicle. Pinagtanggal lang ng catheter sa ER. 